I think we'll wait just a minute more. Uh, seems like people are still coming in. And if you want to write in the chat where you're listening from, we're starting to get a pretty um, nice and diverse Pam Jam or uh, Acoustic Methods community. So I'd love to hear where different people are. Morning, Carly. Uh, West Lafayette, hey Santiago. A lot of Syracuse people here. They're our neighbors, but nice. Okay, well, I guess we can get going. Um, ah, it's really cool to see how how many countries we've got represented. It's just 30 people here. I really like that about these meetings. Um, today, we have a really cool opportunity to dive from terrestrial acoustics into the marine world, which is, I think, one of the first marine-focused method series we've had, at least since I've been listening in to them. Um, and we're super privileged to welcome Leah Buffo, who is an acoustician uh, who trained super rigorously in the world of acoustics for her, I think, undergrad and doctoral work, and really started applying that um, later on, just from a fundamentals of acoustics, then applying it towards understanding um, marine mammals populations through detecting their sounds. And she's done a ton of cool work in, in Norway, in Northern Norway, and I don't know, various oceans around the world. So um, really excited to learn about sound propagation and then her, this new method of listening into marine mammals using fiber optic cables. So this is the Acoustic Methods Club. Leah has sort of leveraged this um, very potentially promising method, this new method for assessing marine mammal um, populations through their vocalizations. And so we'll learn about both of those today. And if any of you have any propagation, physics of sound related questions, please don't be shy. This is the person who I go to, and this is the person that we can uh, go to today. If you have any um, questions about sound propagation in your studies. Um, so with no further ado, Leah, thanks for, uh, Leah, thanks for joining us and floor is yours. Thanks, Ben. Um, I will try to answer all of the questions the best I can. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen and thank you for, uh, well, this awesome introduction. Um, I just want to make sure, Laris, is the screen okay or do we still have the, the, the controls that are appearing on it? Yeah, the I per panel is still appearing. Okay, wait, I did it the wrong way. Let just give me a second. Uh, and now I lost everything. No. <laughs> Sorry about this. Oh yeah, here it is. Okay, I lost the remote control. Uh, got it. I will share again. Yes, that's the way to do it. Okay, this and then hide the remotes. Better? Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Just so you know, I don't see the videos because I'm only on my laptop, so I don't have a, like the view and neither the chat. Um, well, thank you for the awesome introduction. So that's my, that's me. I'm Leah. 
I uh, started as, as a postdoctoral associate at the Kaylee Ziyang Center for Conservation Bioacoustics in January, so this year. Um, and as Ben was saying, I'm going to split the talk into um, two different parts. The first part is going to be a little bit about um, what are the communalities between uh, sound propagation underwater and in the air? And the second part is going to be about my recent research about using fiber optic cables to listen into whales. I just wanted to start off with a cool picture of field work, which is so far the only time I've been doing field work. Uh, <laughs> so that was in Northern Norway. And it was in November, it was freaking cold. Uh, that was just the week uh, of the switching to polar night. So when it's night and dark all the time, and if you see in the back over here, I don't know if you see my pointer, but um, there are a couple of humpback whales. And so we were doing acoustic tagging in, that in those location. And we just success successfully deployed a tag and we were very happy about it. Um, I also want to mention it from the beginning, but uh, so the research part of this work was funded by ARCEX, um, which was, uh, we was financing my postdoc when I was in Norway. So sound propagation above and below water. Um, please do not be, uh, <laughs> those, the images that I'm going to show are um, probably not, those animals do not occur in the same environment. I was just for illustration. But so what we're looking at is like, we have a sender that can send sound above uh, water. So in the air that goes to a receiver or underwater uh, that goes to Another receiver. I do not think clownfish do live in freshwater, but anyhow. Um, and so when we're doing PAM, uh, so passive acoustic monitoring, usually we kind of, um, we are the receiver, the instrument that we're placing uh, outside are our receivers. And so we have microphones uh, in the air and hydrophones underwater. And so basically, often when we're comparing propagation in these two medias, we're often started by, well, the sound speed is completely different. It's 340 meters per second in the air, roughly, and 1,500 meters per second underwater, so it goes much faster. Completely different medium, so we go, we're going to deal with them completely differently. And with that first part of the talk, I wanted to highlight how, well, we're looking at sound waves. So basically, it's the physics is complete, is the same, it's just the medium that is changing. And this is what I wanted to highlight. So first we can look at sound speed and how it changes with the environment. In the air, uh, the sound speed depends on the temperature, the humidity, the speed and direction of the wind. And underwater, it depends on the temperature and salinity. And if we look at how we represent sound speed in the air, it's usually as a function of height uh, or altitude. And um, we can have different sound speed profile depending on um, if it's during the day or during the night, depending on the wind condition. And usually we're saying day or night because the temperature kind of change between, uh, as you know, <laughs> between those two moments of the day. Um, underwater, what we're doing is that we're looking at the sound speed as a variation of depth. And so um, we have been understanding that uh, temperature variations are have a big importance in the first meter of the water column, and then usually it's the hydrostatic pressure, so the pressure of the ocean that makes the sound speed change. Um, I wanted to like have a quick note of the reference that is different uh, in those two media. So usually the, the, the zero is the ground in terms of height uh, when we're looking at sounds in the air, while the surface is zero on the water. So we kind of are working with opposite axis, but why isn't that pretty similar? I would go for, I think in a sense, we're kind of lucky in underwater acoustics because, um, well, because of applications to nonetheless the Navy, um, there has been a lot of work done to understand sound propagation in, in the ocean to measure accurately uh, sound speed profiles. So we have standards for those measurements. And also from historical data, we were, well, we were able, there are uh, data libraries that can, that are um, a list of statistical sound speed profiles for all around the world and all around the globe. 
So now that we know that uh, the environment, uh, the environmental variation uh, that do, do affect the propagation me medium, then this these variation, we can think about them as a stratification. So different layers within the same medium that have, we, each layer could have um, homogeneous properties, but then the just right next layer would be slightly different. So this is what we call the stratification. This affects the propagation of the acoustic waves, which actually means that the acoustics rays are subject to refraction. And this is all uh, understood and explained by the Snell's law. As a reminder, this is what the Snell law is. So it is actually putting together the sound speed in one medium with the angle of the wave propagating through that, that uh, medium. Usually we use um, the angle of the wave front uh, so the direction of propagation, and we're saying that this is preserved in the second medium, so the constants of the angle in the second medium over the sound speed of the second medium, which uh, explains why waves are bending. So if we look at the application of refraction, what does it do when we're looking at uh, sound propagating in the air? So on the top image, we can see that uh, the temperature is decreasing with, um, with the altitude. And so that means that the sound speed is going also to decrease with the altitude. And that uh, creates acoustic waves that are bending toward uh, the upper layers of the atmosphere. As a reverse, the bottom one, uh, the temperature is increasing with the altitude, which is the case, for example, at night. And so for the first layer, the sound speed is actually increasing uh, with altitude, which um, makes the acoustic uh, rays and acoustic waves to bend toward, uh, towards the ground. And when we look into water, so basically here, the way I sorted those different examples are according to the sound speed profile gradient. So what is the inclination of the sound speed profile? And again, because we have uh, different um, referential because underwater we're going towards depth while above water it's towards the altitude, the gradients are opposite. But same thing is what, what we're observing is that when we have a negative gradient, so the top right corner image, the sound speed is decreasing with depth, which causes the acoustic rays to bend towards the bottom and the reverse when the sound speed is increasing with depth to the effect of constant temperature in the ocean and increase of pressure, then the acoustic rays are bending towards the surface. That might be a little much, but what is important to remember for that one slide is that no matter the media, the acoustic waves are bending toward the minimum sound speed. And so again, I will go for maybe something that we're fairly lucky with uh, underwater is that we're bounded by both the surface and the bottom. So that would mean that and actually, the surface often uh, acts as a perfect mirror. And so that means that a wave that is coming and reflecting on the surface would be reflected completely and all the energy would continue in the propagation medium, which is very convenient. Um, as the opposite, um, in the air, we're looking at a half space where uh, one like the dimension is constrained by the ground, but is completely infinite uh, towards the atmosphere which might uh, cause things to be a little more complicated. And so we just looked at kind of general approach to how do waves propagate? What are the shapes in, an, in both environments? But usually uh, what we're interested in is usually the energy and looking at propagation by what we wanna know is how many dB am I losing? For example, uh, when a sound propagate from the source to my receiver. And so um, there's, this is a tool. So the passive sonar equation is a tool that is very common, commonly used in underwater acoustics, um, which is a transmission equation that put in relation all things related to propagations by basically adding up dBs. And so just a little, little uh, note, uh, sonar means sound navigation and ranging. So in a way, no one said that this should be only used underwater. It could be completely used above water. Um, and so a little reminder from my first slide. So we have the sender, the medium, the receiver. And in addition to that, within the medium, we have some ambient noise going on. And this is the sonar equation. 
So it puts in relation the source level, so the sound with its strength that is associated with any source that is, for example, vocalizing. Then the signal is propagating through the medium and does lose some energy. So these are the transmission or propagation losses. And then at the receiver, there will be additional noise, which will decrease the intensity of what we're receiving. Sometimes we take into account processing gain. For example, if you're using an array and doing some kind of beam forming, this would increase the quality of your signal. And so this is a very generic equation that can take a lot of forms. This form is we want the quantity that we're receiving to be above a certain detection threshold. So for example, if I'm looking at a spectrogram, usually I want to be able to see and spot the signal out of the noise. So for example, the detection threshold will be 3 dB because you just want to have this extra intensity. So now looking a little more into the transmission or propagation losses. So basically what is in there is geometrical spreading and excess attenuation. And so what does that mean? Geometrical spreading is how the signal propagating from a source is expanding in all direction. And usually when we're looking at an omnidirectional source, this is, we consider it as it decreases as a spherical wave and it decreases uh, following a 20 log of R um, cur curve. It can happen, and this happens a lot underwater, uh, that this follows a cylindrical spreading. What basically what that means, why we are considering cylindrical spreading, is that initially our source is propagating the same way in all directions, but at some point it will start to interact with the boundaries which are well-defined underwater, which are the surface and the bottom. And so it would just keep spreading, but only in here, what you're seeing on the little graph, only in the R direction. And so this can be assimilated to a cylinder. On the other side, we have the excess attenuation, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, which is basically everything else. So the absorption, the scattering, the ground effects, uh, could be also diffraction depending on the frequency. We have the similar um, we have the similar, a similar excess attenuation underwater, which could be reverberation from the surface, from the bottom, from the volume. So like here, it's an example of a killer whale that is sending a signal and a little portion of it is uh, reflected back uh, from little fish. Um, and which would cause the signal that we're receiving to be a series of a lot of different events, which could be and so as if when you're in a church or a very big environment, you clap your hands, you get echoes from a lot of different positions and locations. That's exactly what this graph is representing. All of those echo, all, all of those arrival of signals that decreases in intensity over time. And so my thought was that to, that is what I wanted to talk about regarding propagation and how I think actually uh, it is very similar under and above water. Um, and I think we could have a little uh, question session in the middle uh, before we're going towards the uh, fiber optic uh, discussion and whales. So and does also anybody have any questions or is anybody trying to do some work focusing on sound propagation, um, either in the terrestrial or marine realms. I'm very curious because, you know, it's a, a big part of acoustic monitoring, but I feel like it doesn't get the attention that maybe it deserves considering its importance. So um, if you have any questions about um, the first part of Leah's, Leah's chat, or if you want to talk about your own work in this area, um, I would really love to to hear. Ben, I, I threw a very naive question in the chat, um, and it is more about you know we're talking about sound level. Uh, where does frequency fit into all that? Um, that equation and the calculation of propagation and propagation loss, or is that something embedded in the equation already? 
That's an excellent question. Uh, can you hear? Can you hear me? I just want to make sure I didn't mute myself. Yes. yes here you okay. Are. Good. That's an excellent question, and that's the point I should have mentioned. Uh, basically, we're, when we're using that equation, we tr we make sure that all the terms in there are from the same bandwidth, for the same frequency range. So, for example, uh, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to uh, extensively talk about blue whales because I like them a lot. Uh, <laughs> but basically, if we consider blue whale range uh, to be between 15 and 25 hertz, what I would want to be looking at is the noise, noise level in that exact frequency range. I would like to, so the ambient noise, I would like to look at the transmission losses or propagation losses for those frequency exactly as well. So again, underwater, we often have a pretty good understanding of how the propagation losses are behaving. So for example, I know that for those frequency, the absorption is very, is almost close to none. And so I can only, I can only consider the geometrical spreading, for example. Then what is the, like, Let's persistent gain is kind of a very specific to certain um, record types of recorders or se certain situations. But then, like the detection threshold would be how many dBs above noise, for example, or how many dBs do I need to be able to say in that frequency band, this is where the signal is. So everything needs to be in the same bandwidth or in the same frequency band. Thanks, Leah. Leah, I would be curious to know, for instance, which sources that should be taken into consideration to measure ambient noise level in terrestrial environments, and how is it that we measure this in terrestrial environments? So, like, um, even in underwater, basically, in this equation, when we talk about ambient noise level, it's the ambient noise at the location of your of your receiver. So could be that, I don't know, you're interested in one specific uh, species of frog. And so everything else to you is noise because this is not the species of interest for you. So what you could do is, for example, if you have de a detection or if you just annotated your data, you could consider in the exact same frequency band. So same form of boxes, the noise that is just before a call, for example. That would give you, and if you do that multiple times, that would give you a good average of uh, your ambient noise at the location of your receiver. And also ambient noise is changing through time. So you won't get the same one in the middle of the night that you would do during the middle of the day. Uh, maybe if you move closer to a waterfall, it would be a lot uh, higher in that frequency band. So that's very dependent on the location of your recorder and of the time of the day. Hi, um, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, first I wanted to thank you uh, is, um, for your presentation. Till now is really interesting. I'm, I'm also working with transmission, but in, in air. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask because I was doing a reviewing methods and formulas mm -hmm. that are being used. And I find a discrepancy of, well, uh, um, and not a straight answer for which formula they use for atmospheric uh, absorption. If they yeah. they include them in the, in the in their formulas for excess attenuation, and mm -hmm. I I just found out uh, from um, I think there is an ISO about how to measure it, but I don't know if that is the one the most accurate for our biological relevance because it's more more. Um, geared towards um, understanding, for example, planes and um, noise yeah. levels. Yeah, I understand completely where you, <laughs> how you're feeling about it. Uh, so I think, yes, a lot of the literature uh, in acoustics, aerial acoustics, acoustic 3D air that is considering co absorption coefficients has been done is in either controlled environment or like really a perfect half space where you have like grass or like um, a road at the bottom, like at the bottom, at the, um, as the ground, and then they're doing the measurements above. Uh, so I think it's a kind of complex problem in the sense that as soon as you put in more vegetation, more 
uh, denser trees, the, depending on the foliage of the trees and depending on the frequency you're looking at, um, that might affect a lot the absorption coefficient that you're uh, that should be used for the problem. So I know how complicated this is and how lucky we are in the water that we actually don't have so many obstacles usually between our source and our receivers. Um, so like in terms of the review, yeah, like there are a few examples that they look through like absorption of a, like through a forest and through so many meters of trees uh, within a forest, for example. And as for a practical example, I think, I don't know, I think it would be extremely beneficial to like try it out for the study sites uh, that you're considering. And so to try it out, like you would control the source level and put like several receivers and look at what is the decrease in the receive levels at your receivers. Thank you very much. Okay. Should I continue? And if we have other questions anyway, like we will have some time for discussions at the end. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so going back in, hiding your lovely faces. <laughs> uh, can you just, I, do you see everything? Is everything okay? I don't see your faces oh, yes. anymore. Yes, it is, yes. I forgot you. Okay, great. Our faces. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so let's talk about whales and fiber optics. So um, I wanted to start, I, I really like maps as a general thing. Uh, and so I wanted to start with this one, which is uh, from a WWF report that was uh, published earlier this year in January. Um, and it's, it is called Protecting Blue Corridors. And so what we're looking at here is the um, migratory corridors of different baleen whale species and sperm whales, which are odontocetes. Just like for those, those of you that might not know, odontocetes are the, um, the marine mammals that are echolocating, they have tooth, uh, while baleen whales have, well, baleens are usually uh, a, a bit larger. And, um, and acoustically, they do produce um, lower frequency sounds in general. And so we're looking at those migratory corridors and the way this data was obtained uh, was using satellite tags that are placed on the whales to be able to track their patterns and uh, movement and to understand a little better um, their migration routes. As you can see on those images, um, well, on this uh, map, sorry, like the colors are of those tracks are mostly orange and green, which are for humpbacks and fin whales. Um, but for the other uh, population, we don't have a good, uh, the other species, we don't always have a good representation of the migratory patterns. And now, um, if you put that in perspective, and acoustics is an excellent tool to be able to uh, understand and study uh, migration patterns uh, and among other things. But if you imagine like how many conservation specific hydrophones would we need to deploy to be able to survey those areas. It would be humongous. And so, of course, for now, um, in a way we can say that we're a little uh, specially undersampled. And, and so I was going through the thinking of different ways that we could help that and solve that in, in a way. And one of the method that appeared to me, um, and after many, many discussions with my colleagues, I didn't think of all of that on, alone by myself, uh, just for disclosure. Um, one of my colleagues told me that we could potentially convert existing in place fiber optic cables and convert them into um, hydrophone and li acoustic listening arrays. And this is a map that represents submarine fiber optic cables. Uh, so it's a illustration, so they're not all represented out there. But my thought was, if we could transform just a small portion of those, that would be already an in incredible step forward. And my, my, but actually my question when my colleague said that was like, this is awesome, how? 
And well, this is what I will explain now. So the method is called distributed acoustic sensing. And so the idea of that method is so there is a fiber optic cable that is has a dark fiber, which means a fiber uh, that is not used. And we're going to plug in an instrument that is called the distributed acoustic sensing interrogator that is uh, represented here on the left. We plug in that instrument to the fiber. And what this instrument is going to do is that it sends laser pulses in the fiber. And because fibers are not per perfect and they have defects that are uh, randomly spread, but present all along the fibers inside the fiber, laser pulses are reflected back toward the interrogator. And so when there is an acoustic wave that comes on the fiber optic cable, it actually slightly moves, moves that de those defects. And what the interrogator, interrogator does is that it measures the, the, the delay uh, between the light pulses that it sent and the light pulse that is received. And it converts that information of delay into strain data. So strain is like the force that is applied on the fiber. And actually strain is analogous to acoustic pressure. So now if you put that in context, so the interrogator is placed on the shore station. So we connect it on land. Um, the fiber optic cable was existing for, in, are usually existing and we can repurpose them. So they're lying at the bottom of the ocean. And so when we plug in the interrogator and well, interrogate for um, getting uh, strain data, what we're doing is that we're doing it at, a, at some location that are spread all along the fiber optic cable. And those locations are called distributed acoustic sensing channels. And this is where we're actually measuring the strain and they're distributed all over. And so now um, this recording is done in real time. So we get the data in very close to real time and we can send it to a data processing center. And in the literature before our study, it was shown that it was possible to record uh, waterborne sources such, uh, such as ships and ergon blasts that are used for seismic exploration. And we showed that we could uh, eavesdrops on whales. So let me take you to uh, our, well, where we did this experiment. So this experiment was conducted in Svalbard, which is the uh, archipelago that you see in the middle of this map, uh, next to east of Greenland. And it's just right at the doorstep of the Arctic Ocean. At that location, uh, because of uh, climate change and the warming up of the oceans, we observe that uh, boreal species, so species that usually are more uh, temperate water species, have a poleward shift towards their preferred water temperatures and food sources. And so, for example, in Svalbard, uh, they have observed an increased number of sightings of blue whales, minke whales, and fin whales at higher latitudes. At the same time, because the ice cover, is, well, because the ice is melting and the ice cover is shrinking, our human use of these um, the spaces is changing as well. And for example, um, one one uh, one of the example that I think is kind of striking is that there are plans for a cross Arctic shipping lane uh, that would go uh, just along Svalbard. So now the experiment we conducted is at this red pin here, and this is a zoom in. So this location is called Isfjord, so it's a fjord. Um, and the blue line that you see here is a fiber optic uh, telecommunication cable that is collect, collect, connecting sorry, the city of, of Longyearbyen to Nielsen, a research station that is a little more no north in Svalbard. And uh, you can see some uh, numbers that are spread along this fiber optic cable. They correspond to the distance from shore from the interrogator in kilometers. So the interrogator was placed on, uh, was connected on land uh, during the summer 2020. We recorded for 42 days uh, with a sampling frequency of about 600 hertz, uh, which allows us to uh, record most well a lot of the baleen whales so blue whales fin whales maybe a little bit of humpback sea whales for example and we had a spatial resolution of four meter which means that 
we had a sensing point, one of those virtual channels, every four meter all along the way, over 120 kilometers. So uh, my first task looking at, uh, well, actually ginormous amount of data was to identify, can we record whales? And these are spectrograms of the of some of the signals that um, we found. Uh, I definitely analyzed some those signals using Raven. <laughs> and so you're going to hear the second line and the third line. So the first one is a spectrogram of a North Atlantic blue whale. It's very is recognizable from its shape, from its frequency, from its duration, and from the repetition of the signal. I exported the audio, but I only did it with uh, 3.5 times the speed, which means that it's not like if you don't have a, a very good headset, you might not hear it. So I thought we would focus on the two others. Um, the second one is could be a North Atlantic blue whale, but could also be a humpback that is kind of doing very similar signals. And the last series is, we called it a series of downsweep. Now with a little bit of uh, taking a step back, I think these are uh, social call, 40 Hertz uh, calls from fin whales. And you can also see that there are different distances that are ma marked just right next to the spectrograms, which correspond to where on the fiber these were recorded. So, okay, let's listen to the second one. Okay, and the third one. Note also that the color scale is actually in train that this transforming into dB and uh, not as uh, acoustic dB. Okay, so. Now that we were able to find signals, so we did actually um, a big uh, manual analysis, visual and oral analysis of the data using Raven. And so uh, we marked a signal and categorized them at that time as either downsweep, blue whale as in blue whale stereotype signals, so the first spectrogram that we saw just before, the arch sound that was part of the second line, and, and some other signals that are like that we could not identify. And so I want to focus on downsweep and the blue whale. And you can see like from the histograms of where we detected the signals along the fiber optic cable that the blue whale, so these are the blue bars, are mostly found uh, between 70 and 90 kilometers of the fiber optic cable. And so if you look at the map, they're outside of the fjord, while the downsweeps, which are most likely either decals or fin whale social calls, and both, both are actually social calls, are mostly found between 40 and 60 kilometer, which is just right at the entrance of the fjord. And so I, th I thought this was kind of cool that with one recording system, we could actually differentiate location between the signals that are recorded and already kind of see different use of habitat uh, uh, based on those signals. So, then it was just, okay, how could we visualize all of that data? Is this just a question of representation? And this is where I will uh, shake your uh, neurons maybe a little bit just to understand that image. So here we're representing, so lower part, we're representing the signal that is recorded along the fiber optic cable. So we see the distance between 70 and, uh, well, a little before 70 and uh, until 85 kilometer, which is like the pink section on the map. And we're representing that as a function of time, just to make you feel a little more comfortable. Um, these, if we're looking at the, the, the virtual sensor that was around 67 kilometer and do the spectrogram of it, you can see that what we're recording is actually a blue whale signal, blue whale stereotype signal with those long tonal signals and some down sweeps. And you can see how it matches what we're looking at on the bottom panel. Now on the bottom panel, you see that the signals are recording along the fiber optic cable with some delay. Those delays, if you look at the white line that are on the right side, 
do correspond to the sound speed, the speed of sound underwater. And so these are just time delays between like the source and all, and all the receivers. Again, the, these results are presented in strain values. So now I'm going to move to a little, slightly more complicated example where, again, we have uh, so the fiber and the below we're seeing, again, exactly same type of representation. So data recorded along the fiber as a function of time. I will help you because these are not um, super easy to spot. The contrast is not the best. But we can see one um, hyperbolas that correspond to the di one direction of a whale around the little points that is that is marked as one. We can see a couple others that are inside the fjord. And so if we look at the spectrograms at the marked location where the, the little bar is for each one of those examples, we can actually recognize, again, North Atlantic blue whale signals and a bunch of dawn sweeps inside the fjord. And so what that shows us, so this is a 130 second recording. What it is showing us is that using distributed acoustic sensing, we can record multiple whale, whales and have an idea of where they are along the fiber optic cable just by looking at the data. And here we are simultaneously recording at least three whales. Maybe like two of them are very close together and we can't differentiate that, but at least we have three different locations where we know there are whales. Now, if we continue, this is another type of representation of exactly the same example with the three different whales. So now we're looking at the frequency content of it as a function, well, distance as a function of frequency. And so you can spot the very tonal signal from the blue whale is here, which is at about 17.6 Hertz. And this is the frequency band that is covered by the dawn sweeps that were at the two other locations. The right side is going to be um, an, uh, an animation that over the 130 seconds of the recording, every two seconds, we're doing the Fourier transform of the signal to look at the frequency content for each one of the channels all along the fiber. And all of this average and kind of uh, process a little bit is giving us the picture that is on the left side. So you can have a look every two seconds. This is what is going on. So we have the sweeps uh, in the lower part. And we have, again, the, 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 yeah, the blue whale that just happened here. And again, some of the sweeps here. So these were a representation. Now, what can we do with this? Can we do a little better than just say, I have three whales along the fiber optic cable? We actually investigated uh, localization. Um, and so we call it near field because the distance between the whale and the fiber is very small in comparison to the all, all over 120 kilometer length of the fiber. Um, and so uh, what we did is that we compared theoretical time difference of arrival for different positions uh, all around the fiber to uh, measure time difference of arrival. And um, we tried to optimize it to find the best fit. And so um, we compared uh, what we obtained. We tested it um, with the, si the signal of a passing ship because ships have are emitting and transmitting their position using AIS, AIS sorry, uh, basically as GPS for ship. And so we could actually compare our acoustic results with the AAS positions. And so this is the, a representation of the track of a ship and the little white dots are our acoustic locations, localizations. And so using that information, we were able to uh, beamform uh, the signal from the, from the whale to increase its quality. So summing up the signal to enhance and increase the SNR. So the first image is, again, distance versus time representation. And the two lower panels are the, or the spectrogram and the waveform of the beamform signal. And you can see that uh, over the course of those 666 seconds, the whale is actually moving along the fiber. Uh, you can see the displacement that is highlighted by the white line. And we can listen to uh, this one spectrogram here. And feel the down sweeps. There you go. Mm 
Okay. And one final thing that we investigated using that data um, is, I don't know if you were aware of that paper, but to me, that was a extremely cool paper, which was using the song of fin whales to image um, the crust, the earth crust. And so, and this was done using ocean bottom seismometers, which are um, usually have one hydrophone and are lower at the bottom of the ocean and used in seismology. And so what we wanted to do is to, instead of using a series of fin whale song, which is what they did in that paper, uh, use one call, D call, which is emitted by blue whales and see if we could image what was going on in the ground uh, using all of the, those receiver uh, the, along the fiber optic cables that we have or all of those virtual sensing points. And so this is two different location inside and outside the fjord. And basically analyzing the time of arrival of the different signals, we were able to make those little pictograms that you can see on the top right corner of each one of those images and understand that um, the first ground layer inside the fjord is thicker than the one that is outside the fjord, which did match uh, previously measured, uh, ge measured geophysical surveys of their location. So moving towards uh, conclusion, so we can repurpose existing infrastructure and using distributed acoustic sensing, which enables the monitoring of whales in their environment in real time and a new spatial scales and resolutions. And all of this work was published in the uh, mentioned paper and the data that was associated to those, the paper is also available. And basically uh, some perspective for biology, conservation and the ecology of whales and their habitats. So I think there are a few advantages that we can do acoustic recording with minimum uh, infrastructural and operational costs. Uh, we have we can have using the entire existing system of fiber optic cable, we can increase the spatial coverage uh, that we have so far and have potential real time monitoring of crucial areas. We know of some limitation, I mean, of course, as any method. Uh, for now, uh, distributed acoustic sensing uh, is limited to the first repeaters, repeater. So repeaters are pl placed along uh, commercial telecommunication fiber optic cable to enhance the data transmission. Usually these are between 50 and 70 kilometers offshore. And of course, the availability of fiber optic cable, especially commercial ones, can be tricky. It can be tricky to get access to them. Uh, so that's a very, uh, well, that's, yeah, one of the limitations. And in terms of follow-up studies, um, what we want to be doing is to assess the quality of the data, recorded data, um, compare it like one to one with a hydrophone and see, okay, are we exactly getting the same thing? Uh, understand a little better how it works at higher frequencies to see what are the species that we will be able to monitor with this, this system. And also basically develop ways to be dealing with the enormous amount of data that we're recording. Um, just a kind of fun note, we're recording about seven terabytes of data per day um, along the fiber optic cable. And uh, this is maybe one question for you and thoughts about like the entire presentation. Uh, where do you see synergies between marine and terrestrial bioacoustics? Where can we learn from each other? And thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, uh. So anybody, any questions, comments? I think Ashik. Um, hey, Leah, great presentation and thanks for sharing that. Um, many, many questions come to my mind. One a very immediate one. Do you see a potentially a similar system on the terrestrial side of it where people can tap into that information? And second one is data access. Um, yeah. Where do you access the fiber optic data 
to then integrate that into your research? So for the first one, I already have the answer. Uh, so there are lots of uh, distributed acoustic sensing um, exploration for terrestrial application. Right now, there are a couple of articles uh, that were mostly done in labs. Uh, one of them is to detect footsteps of polar bears around research stations. Uh, the other one, they actually wrapped a fiber optic cable around, uh, around a tree, and they wanted to detect critters and invasive uh, termite species, I believe. I'm not sure if they were successful or not, but that was what they were trying to do. So, and I know, like, for example, in Norway, they're... Um, they are using the fiber optic cables that are running along train tracks, instrumenting those. And I know one of the research questions is to look at footsteps of uh, deers that would be crossing, for example, the tracks to slow down trains to avoid collision. I mean, it's not exactly bioacoustics, but <laughs> these are terrestrial applications. So let's go for that. And can you imagine this for like ground communication of elephants? <laughs> So have ideas. <laughs> and for the second question, which I think was about the accessibility of the data, um, I'm not sure if you meant at data or fiber. Um, Access but... to the data um, from when the data is collected by the fiber optic system. How can yeah. yourself, a scientist like yourself access that? And how easy so... is that? So just like just to make things clear, so the fiber by itself doesn't record data. We have to plug in the instrument to be collecting the data. Um, so right now, so the Norwegian experiment, for example, uh, has been like sending data to our university in Antenu right now because I'm not there anymore. I don't have access to that data anymore, which is very frustrating. Uh, but as a kind of lighter and nicer note, there is uh, an experiment that is conducted in Oregon uh, which is completely open access. So it, like the idea is like, if you have enough um, very, very big hard drives, you're good to go. <laughs> Thank you. I see Dimitri's wondering what the highest frequency you can measure with the fiber optic cable. This is one of the things that we want to explore a little more. I can give the answers that we have right now, which is constructors, uh, constructors, uh, vendors of the interrogator, they tell us that the instrument is not limited in frequency. Um, but, if, well, or at least not not this is not really a big constraint but when you're connecting the interrogator to the fiber optic cable the light pulses that are sent need to go all the way to the end of the fiber and come back before being able to send another pulse in there this um time between two different pulses is the one over your sampling frequency so you're constrained by the length of your fiber optic cable if you want to, meaning if you have a very long fiber optic cable without repeaters, you can only sample at very low frequencies. If you have a very short cable, then you can go at higher frequencies. The second part, which is the part that we want to explore, um, is now the fibers are not like just a one fiber optic cable that is basically as thin as one hair lying down at the bottom of the ocean. They have like some casing and they're wrapped into like some metal structure, um, we think that this might prevent us to be able to use it for very high frequencies. So I really doubt that we'll be able, for example, to record any dolphins with them because they're like dolphins just for dolphins are usually above 10 kilohertz um, or at least the, what we where we want to <laughs> be recording them. I don't think we'll be able to record that type of data with fiber optics, or at least not with the current technology. So right now, what we want to try is to see, we want to compare hydrophone and fiber optics uh, for humpback whales and see how much of the humpback whales repertoire can we cover with the fiber optics. And then we will know.
Anybody have any other questions or comments about, you know, what Marine Pam can learn from terrestrial and vice versa? You know, I think in the marine realm, like Leah was talking about how um, acoustic, like sound speed profiles and acoustic environments, it's mapped pretty comprehensively for, um, I guess, or at least modeled for large portions of um, our oceans. And that sort of effort, I don't think has really, we're still in the early phases of that terrestrially. Um, similarly, there's a big effort in the marine realm to characterize sort of source levels and um, detection ranges for um, marine mammals. And still in the terrestrial realm, that's a very active area, a growing area of research. And so um, we have one, one person on our talk, I think, um, Marcos. Yeah, Marcos is is working in this area. And I'm curious if anybody else is actively exploring um, source level studies or um, cue rates. So how, how often a given animal is vocalizing in a, in a period of time. All of these things I think are more well-developed in the marine context. And now we're trying to answer some of those questions more in the terrestrial realm. Well, ah, Sheik. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a perennial extrovert, so I need to jump in whenever there's a pause. Um, Leah, in your uh, one of your slides, you presented the uh, TDOA, the time delay of arrival model versus uh, calculated. So I'm assuming that you have calculated the errors potentially. What are the sources of those errors? in the fiber optic system? So I think what I did for the TDOA is extremely rustic. I will start with that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the main source of error that we were get like that I was getting was basically, how do you pick the time of arrival? Uh, when you have those signals that propagate through the water, um, we were in shallower water than what I'm used to. Uh, I used to work in very deep waters. And so we would get a lot of interferences on those signals. And so at some location, it didn't come directly. Some other were, didn't have the intensity. Um, so picking up the correct time of arrival was definitely not a trivial work. Um, so I think that would was probably one of the, probably the main source of error uh, that I've observed in the data. Um, I was also doing it on, not on detection so i would just like slice up my signal uh and like do a cross correlation between my theoretical and what i was getting uh every i think it was every five seconds or something like that so of course like if you don't have a vocalization the, the, the correlation coefficient was very low and you and when they had it was very high so i was like okay this is where the whale is supposed to be our estimation of the location or along the fiber was great uh the estimation of the range was not really good. So, so I think this can definitely be improved. Uh, yeah, by probably someone that knows a lot more than me about location. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. That was a really amazing talk, Leia. So thanks for taking the time to prepare that and um, be here with us. Next week, or I'm sorry, in two weeks, we'll also have um, what I think is a very interesting theme. Camille Desjoncaire will be leading a session all about how climate change is um, affecting soundscapes and species, you know, acoustic activity and potentially how we can learn about our, our changing climate through acoustic monitoring. So be sure to show up for that one and if you have any friends or colleagues who are interested, you can share 
the email that we'll send out announcing the event. And um, they could also sign up to the listserv or you can send me their contact information and we'll get them signed up. Um, so thanks everybody for, for coming out and hope you have a great rest of the week. Bye. Bye.